Well, hi, and welcome to Grace Church. My name is Zach Stamp. I'm the pastor at our Canton location. And uh, just thrilled to be able to share with you what God has been laying on my heart. So uh, if you have your Bible or your device, go ahead and grab it and turn with me to Luke chapter 23. We're going to be camping out there with the time that we have this morning. Now, you may or may not know this about me, but both of my parents are from the state of Nebraska, which means by default they grew up on farms. Now, when they turned 18, they went to the University of, of uh, Nebraska, they studied, and then a few years later they graduated and they found themselves moving to Cincinnati, Ohio to begin their career and ultimately to start their family, which meant that me being one of their children, that, that meant that I grew up a huge Nebraska Cornhusker fan. I mean, we went to games, we had bumper stickers, those old school starter jackets, we even had those stupid corn like foam heads. We were massive fans. Well, hearing that, people will often ask me, well, then how in the world did you ever become an Ohio State fan? And the answer to that is actually really simple. My older brother, Andy. See, my older brother in high school played football, and, and he was a pretty good fullback, uh, a running back, uh, but he was an exceptional kicker. He actually earned all state honors. He was recognized nationally, had major universities in the Big Ten, and, and even schools like, for example, Notre Dame, offering him the opportunity to come play for them. Well, naturally, as huge Husker fans, we were hoping that they would call him, but uh, they never did. Uh, so he ended up going to the closest school at the time, which was Ohio State. And that is when my indoctrination began. See, because of my brother, because of Andy, we had tickets to every home game, every away game, and every bowl game for four years, right? And we weren't just given tickets. In fact, we were given VIP experiences, right? Where they were like trying to woo us into fandom. For example, on game days, we were given special parking passes that allowed us to park right next to the stadium, right? Like we, we didn't have to park two miles away and take buses in or anything like that. We just were, par we parked right there. And we didn't have to go in through the crowded gates with everybody else, but instead we, we got to go through a side door that was just for players' families. And when we walked through that door, they would just simply ask us, who are we with? And we would say, we are with Andy Stamp. And because we were with Andy, because we were with him, we were given special tickets and special passes that literally had his name on them. And because of him, we were given private access to our seats. Now, our seats weren't like everybody else's seats, right? Like you couldn't buy these seats on, on StubHub. These, these seats were on the 50-yard line, just a few rows up, and we were surrounded by all the other players' families. These were the absolute best seats in the entire stadium. And not only did we get great seats, but for every home game, we had unlimited snacks, unlimited food, free drinks, not because of who we were, but because of who he was. And then after the game, we didn't have to brave the congestion of 110,000 people. We just simply left our seats, walked down a, a private ha uh, hallway to the locker room, and eventually to our car where we had sort of VIP access exiting the parking lot. So we didn't have to deal with all of the congestion, and all the traffic, all of this simply because we were with my brother. <laughs> well, after a while of enjoying this full transparency, I kind of forgot that I was with him. And I began viewing these tickets, these, these perks, right? This, this parking pass, these, these seats, this food as mine. And it was subtle, but I began to claim ownership of something that wasn't mine. And I started to believe that I was there because of who I was and not because of who my brother was. Well, in many ways, guys, I, I think we do this with God as well. See, we know theologically that, that we are here only because we are with Jesus. But somewhere along the line, we forget that. And we lose sight of that. And like me and my brother's tickets, we start believing that we're here because of who we are instead of who God is. And it's subtle, but we begin to think that since we read the Bible... Since we maybe have a quiet time, give some money, serve at the church, go on a mission trip, fill in the blank, that somehow we have earned the right to be in the kingdom because of who we are and what we have done. Listen, church, when this happens, we get all spiritually disoriented, right? We get confused. We're not sure what is up and what is down. We confuse who we are 
with who God is. We confuse what we do with what God has done for us. So this morning, I want to uh, continue our series by, by looking at a story that will prayerfully reorient our attention and our affections upon the cross. Reminding us that we're here not because of what we've done or who we are, but because of what God has done and ultimately who he is. And that's ultimately what leads us to Luke chapter 23. Now, at this point in, in Luke 23, Jesus has already been arrested. He's already been tried and, and, and declared guilty and punished to death by crucifixion. He's been beaten literally up to the, 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 the point of death, right? He's been nailed to a wooden cross. He's, he's hanging there in front of everybody and the shame and the scorn and the hatred of the people and the soldiers is being poured out upon him. It's like unleashed, right? And while all of that is happening, Jesus has an interaction with two men who are being crucified next to him. And that's where we pick up the story starting in verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, meaning Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, meaning Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let's pause there for a few moments. So here we see Jesus again on the cross with a criminal to his left and a criminal to his right. And they're all three being crucified. Now, in this situation, we see that, that, that both of these men have a lot in common, but they are also very different. So what I want to do is, is, is I want to look at what they have in common and how they are different and what that might mean for us. All right. So first, let's look at what they have in common. Right. Both of these men, as we see in the story, are labeled as criminals. Now, what does that mean that they are criminals? Did they did they jaywalk? Did they get pulled over for speeding, maybe a little insider trading, or, or maybe they, they hurt someone? Like, like, what kind of crime did they commit? Well, Matthew and Mark in their Gospels actually describe these men as thieves or robbers. In fact, the word that they actually use in the original Greek is consistent with, with the crime of ruthless bandits of revolutionaries or, or individuals who are trying to violently overthrow a government, like, like insurrectionists. Now, these types of crimes always involve violence and death, right? Like, these were not like white-collar crimes. So think something more in the line of Bonnie and Clyde, right? Or, or Mussolini in Italy, or, or, or even the nastiness and, and divisive bloody nature of our own civil war, right? That's what they are being accused of. So, me, so let me be clear. They weren't labeled criminals because they didn't, I don't know, pay for a drink at the local gas station or because they took a chicken from their, their neighbor. No, they're both being labeled as criminals because they are violent revolutionaries. They are thugs. They are thieves who are looking to overthrow power and all the, the government. So we see that, that, that both of these men committed the same crime. But we also see that both of these men are facing the same sentence, which in this case is death. Now, death is the ultimate consequence, is it not? Because there's no recovery from death. Like, you can recover from having to pay a fine, right? In fact, you, you, you can recover from a little community service. In fact, you can even recover from some jail time. But you cannot recover from death. Death is final. It's literally the epitome of hopelessness because there is no turning back. There is no do-over. It's, it's just over. It's finished. It's, it's final, right? And both of these men are facing the reality of death. And there is no court appeal. There is no delay. Death is upon them. They're sitting on the cross and they're staring death in the face. And utter hopelessness and despair must have been upon them. So both of these men, they committed the same crime. They had the same sentence. But what we see in the story is that they also face the same mechanism of death, which in this case is crucifixion. Now, crucifixion wasn't merely meant to be a means to, to kill someone, to execute someone, right? 
The Romans had much bigger plans for, for crucifixion than that. See, crucifixion was meant to be this prolonged experience of pain and agony. To bring people to the point where they would break and then take them twice as far, right? It was meant to be a time of, of great humiliation as people were often crucified naked, right? It was a time of, of shame and absolute mockery. In fact, it was supposed to be so thick and heavy that the people who were being crucified at times would beg for the Roman soldiers to just end it, to kill them, to, to, to put them to death. They longed for death, but the Roman soldiers, instead of putting them to death, would actually prolong the experience. They would make it last as long as possible, forcing suffering and despair to linger until they were forced to take their final breath. So both of these men faced the same crime. They faced the same sentence and they bore the same penalty of death and despair and humiliation by crucifixion. Well, here's the thing. There's a good chance that many, if not all of us, are like, man, whew, I'm glad that's not me. I'm glad I'm not on their cross. I'm glad I'm not in their sandals, right? I'm glad I'm not experiencing the hopelessness and the death that they are. But guys, here's the cold, hard reality of truth. Is that we are just like the criminals. In fact, we are the criminals in the story. See, just like, like, like Adam and Eve, our sin, no matter how big or how small it may seem, is a rebellion against God, which makes us just like these criminals. Rebels, revolutionaries, and insurrectionists against God and his authority. And not one of us is innocent. Scripture tells us that all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of God's standard. See, just like the criminals, the wages of our sin, what we've earned with our rebellion is death. What we've earned is, is our cross. It's, it's our death. It's eternal separation from God. And the worst part of it all, again, just like the criminals, is there's nothing we can do about it. There's no appeal. There's no reprieve. There's no, there's, there's no hope. Like the two men on the cross, we're stuck on our cross, humiliated and suffering in a place of utter hopelessness. We are just like those criminals. But here's the thing, that's where the comparison ends and the contrast begins. So how are these men different? Well, first we see that in this case, one man mocks Jesus, right? While the other man fears Jesus. Now, when it says that he fears Jesus, this is ultimately a recognition that God is God and the criminal is not. That this is a realization that God has all authority and that the criminal has none, right? It's a realization that he answers to God, that God doesn't answer to him. So don't miss this. While, while one man submits to God's authority, the other one completely denies it. Now, I'm not sure about you, but that is incredibly convicting for a couple different reasons, right? First, I think it's, it's convicting because it's so easy for us to deny God's authority like the mocking criminal, right? Where we feel like we know better than God and we could even do a better job than God. Now, I, I say it all the time, but listen, we make terrible gods, right? We make horrible gods, yet for some reason we keep trying to ascend to his throne. Man, when will we ever get it through our thick heads and hard hearts that God has authority, not us. Second, I think it's convicting because I think it's easy to recognize God's authority, yet not submit to it, right? right? It, it, it's easy to, to, to know that, that, that God is God, and, and, he, and he calls us and challenges us to live a certain way, or, or, or to be a certain way, or to value certain things, and we're like, eh, God, I'll I'll follow you on this, but not on this, right? Like, I'll, I'll give you authority on this, but, 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 but not on this. Listen, when we resist submitting to God's authority, it's really just another way of denying it like the other criminal. So one man, in this case, fears Jesus, and the other one denies him. Second way that, that these men are different is that one man denies Jesus' innocence, while the other one confesses it. In fact, I love the way that he says it here in verse 41. He says, uh, the one criminal says, we are indeed suffering justly. In other words, we are receiving what we deserve. But he, Jesus, he doesn't deserve any of this. In other words, he is innocent, but we are not. 
So don't miss this. This is this man's confession of sin. He admits it. He doesn't run from it. He doesn't deny it. He's not trying to displace it on other people. He's not trying to say, the Romans made me did it. No, he owns his sin. And there's something intriguing here. There's, there's something about seeing the innocence of Jesus that stimulates within this man a greater awareness of his offense and his mistakes, of his sin. In other words, the, the sinless perfection of Jesus, his innocence, has a way of opening our eyes to, in, in, in our hearts to the reality of our brokenness. See, you don't always see how, how dirty something is until it's compared to something that's pure and holy, right? It's kind of like my kid's soccer socks, right? Jackson plays soccer and his, his uh, um, away jersey has white socks and, and, and those things get dirty, but you don't really know how dirty those things are until you compare them next to a, a pair of brand new white socks. Listen, when, when, when we do that, those old socks aren't white, they're brown, right? But you don't see how dirty they are until it's compared to something so pure and holy. And in a similar way, the reality of our guilt and our sin is most evident when seen against the backdrop of Christ's innocence. And the one man sees his innocence and it compels him to realize his, his sinfulness, which leads him to a place of confession and surrender. But don't miss this. The other man doesn't see it that way, does he? His pride has blinded him to the reality of his sin and his guilt. And again, that's super convicting because I think it's so easy for us to allow our, our pride to blind us to the reality of our sinfulness. Where we deny our sin, we, we refuse to acknowledge it. In fact, again, we displace it upon others. So one man, in this case, denies Jesus' innocence while the other man confesses it and even surrenders to it. Third way that these men are different is that one man, in this case, turns from Jesus while the other man turns towards Jesus. Again, I love the words he uses here in verse 42. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Listen, these are simple words of a statement of this man's absolute need for Jesus to speak for him, to stand in the gap for him between him and God to defend him, to speak for him, to do for him the criminal, what he could never do for himself. So he says, Jesus, remember me, remember my name, remember my confession and my absolute need for you to achieve for me what I could never achieve for myself. And listen to how Jesus responds in verse 43. He says, truly I say to you, today you shall be, listen to these words, with me in paradise. In other words, Jesus welcomes this criminal, this, this rebel, this, this insurrectionist into his kingdom, in, into eternity, not because of who the criminal is, but because of who Jesus is. Um, Alistair Begg, famous Scottish pastor and theologian, um, tells this story about how when he gets to heaven, the very first person he's going to look up when, when he gets there is this criminal. And, and he wants to find him and he wants to say, man, how did that shake out for you, right? How did you get here? Because on one hand, you were cursing Jesus with your friend. You've never been to a Bible study. You've never been baptized. You know nothing about church membership, yet you made it. How in the world did you make it? And he talks about how uh, he, he imagines the angel at the gates of heaven welcoming people in. And this criminal walks up to him and, and the angel's like, well, what are you doing here? And the criminal's like, I don't know. And the angel's like, what do you mean you don't know? And the, the criminal's like, I don't know. And the angel says, so let me get this straight. You know nothing about the doctrine of justification by faith? And the criminal's like, I've never heard of it. <laughs> The angel says, so you know nothing about scripture and the great commission. The, the criminal's like, what are you talking about? The angel says, so you know nothing about the sovereignty of God or predestination or the end times. And the man just sort of has this blank stare on his face. And he says, I can imagine the angel at that point saying, so on what basis are you even here? And the criminal responds, because the man on the middle cross said, I can come. Listen to me, that is a profound explanation of what's happening in this story. 
because this man and we bring nothing to the table but our sin and our inability to make ourselves right with God. Yet Jesus took upon his pure and holy shoulders this man's sin and ours, and he imputes upon us his innocence, bestowing upon him and, 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 and us what we do not deserve and what we could never earn, and that is forgiveness and redemption. See, forgiveness and eternity are not things that we achieve, but they are things that Jesus achieves for us. There are no good works no religious rituals, no theological understandings or quiet time or mission trip. None of those things will earn you favor with God. It's simply because we are with him and he says we can come. It's simply because we are with the man on the middle cross. And hear me this, that is really good news. Because every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And all of us, just like these criminals, earn death by the cross, and there's nothing we can do about it, like absolutely nothing. Yet what we see in Scripture in this story is that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved, that he, Jesus, the man on the middle cross, will stand in the gap for you, that he will remember you, and you will hear him speak those same words over you that truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. And so we are here not because of us, but because of him. We are here not because, because we did everything right, but because the man in the middle cross said we could come. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is so easy for us to become spiritually disoriented where we make things all about us and who we are instead of about you, instead of about who you are and what you've done for us. The truth is that all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of your standard, which means that all of us are just like these criminals. So Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see our junk, our sin, and to bring us to a point of a confession and surrender where we lay our sin before you, acknowledging Jesus as Lord. So would you forgive us? Would you restore us? Would you remember us? And even as we respond in worship, let each of us take some time for personal reflection and confession, reorienting our attention and our affection upon Jesus, the man on the middle cross. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.